Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to chair this seminar and to be part of the ELI panel, which is working on artificial intelligence and public administration, impact assessment and public participation for digital democracy. It is inevitable, and history attests to this, that law often has to respond to new technological development. Thus has it ever been. Law responded to new technological development in the Industrial Revolution. It responded to new technological development in the um, Computer Revolution. Everyone will know, for example, that the advent of computerization generated a whole series of interesting and important legal issues which lawyers had to grapple with. So do, so too did the related development of the creation of the internet. Private international lawyers had to cope with new issues and new problems about jurisdiction and substantive choice of law of a kind which did not exist. Having said that, artificial intelligence and the advent of artificial intelligence poses very significant problems and interesting issues for both public and private lawyers. There are, to coin a phrase, many views of this particular cathedral. And what the object of this particular ELI initiative is, is to approach the issue of artificial intelligence from the perspective of impact assessment. In other words, to try and develop tools which will decide or help us to decide whether artificial intelligence should be used, and if so, the circumstances and conditions which should attach to its use. This is particularly important because there is inevitably or there are inevitably quite important problems about opacity and the difficulties of understanding what artificial intelligence is, is doing, more particularly because the use of artificial intelligence can have important implications for individual rights and for the discharge of public duties. The ELI panel, which has been convened to uh, undertake this task. It's been a great, great pleasure to be part of it. It exhibits, if I may say so, all the best features of the ELI. There's a great gender balance. There's a great balance of common law and civil law. And there's a great balance of geography as well, in terms of East Europe, West Europe, uh, UK, etc. And also, what is terrific about this particular panel, ably chaired by Mark, is that we have um, age diversity and we have a, a real blend of old people like myself, but also young scholars who have made really terrific contributions to the project. So I would simply like to pay tribute to the very hard work of all the members of the team, including the young members who deserve very great credit for getting us to where we have got to now. Enough from me. We have a really, really interesting panel lined up with two, as it were, internals, Marc Clement and uh, Jens Peter Schneider, who've both been central figures and two of the rapporteurs for this panel. And then we are really, really pleased to have Brando and Peggy to bring external perspectives, one from the EU, Brando being an MEP, and one from Peggy, who is uh, representing in this context the Council of Europe. We're really grateful for the participation of both Brando and Peggy in this webinar. So without more ado, let me pass over to Brando, who is going to give a perspective, an external perspective, on these issues, in particular from the perspective of the EU, having been involved intimately with EU initiatives concerning artificial intelligence. If I could just remind all panelists, the rules of the game are 10 minutes for the presentation. 
Brando, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me to provide, uh, uh, as it was said, an external point of view on uh, this uh, very interesting uh, uh, project uh, that is putting forward a valuable um, uh, model to uh, address one of the most sensitive areas where AI comes uh, at play, which is uh, the provision of public services. An area where uh, we are seeing a lot of new developments, in particular in the last few years, also accelerated by COVID-19 and where specific and serious problems can arise. Of course, uh, I will intervene in my capacity as appointed rapporteur for the AI Act in the European Parliament. So I will also refer to the um, a proposed, uh, I would refer to this proposed regulation and how the project can contribute to its implementation, knowing that we will start the proper, the proper drafting work in the upcoming weeks. Uh, indeed, many of the use cases where public administration can and already to some extent does use already AI are listed as high risk in Annex 3 of the draft uh, regulation. And one is among the prohibited use cases of Article 5, with its known exceptions for uh, law and for enforcement purposes. The nature of these services, often dealing with life-changing decisions for citizens, as well as the nature of automated decision-making with its intrinsic capacity, require indeed an extra layer of care when adopting a specific AI system to this aim. Even more so as currently public administrations often do not have the competences and resources, financial as well as human, to develop in-house systems, but rather resort to procurement with risks of focusing more on pricing as selection, uh, as a criteria for selection, rather than robustness, full compliance with the data protection rules and so on, or, or public-private partnerships in the best cases, therefore with non proprietary proprietary software. In such cases that currently constitute a majority, public administration would have the role of the user for which the regulation foresees, as you know, some obligations, including that of conducting a data protection impact assessment in accordance with the GDPR and the law enforcement directive for high risk systems. This is rightly acknowledged also in the article three of the proposed rules. I mentioned all of this to say that there is already uh, an attention to all these aspects in the regulation proposed by the Commission, but the Parliament will try to ameliorate it uh, and to uh, go deeper into some of the points that I touched and others. An additional element of concern uh, that is important to, to, to underline uh, is that the conformity assessment procedure to demonstrate compliance with the proposed regulation can be for many of the mentioned use cases a mere self-assessment procedure by the developer, be it a private entity or to a less extent a public authority itself, supported by standards. However, these are not yet all there and require time to develop, especially for such complex and changing technologies. While we also know from product safety legislations how violations in such cases are only discovered after damages occur, which in this case would be too big a risk. It becomes therefore even more urgent to have an additional impact assessment in the case of AI and public administration carried out by what is often the user, not the developer. Imagine the implications of an AI system for making decisions on granting or withdrawing social security benefits or an asylum request. If and when competent authorities found out about the problem, far too many lives would be ruined. Actually, we have already examples of problems with some AI applications used by public administration leading to biased or simply wrong decisions with or without the AI Act that call for extra care. That is why I consider this project particularly valuable and complementary to the work we are starting on the AI Act, in particular for proposing a uniform set of rules that can be adopted by all European authorities in a sector where the uptake of AI has been quite patchy and often bottom up. With the emergence of some interesting best practices at local level, 
as well as major problems. I believe that local authorities can largely benefit from these rules, in particular as the scarcity of resources would make it hard for them to ensure a speedy up uptake of AI systems. Even though this would largely contribute to resource efficiency and optimization in the longer term. So these model rules can be a very valuable support as the assessment list of the high level expert group when it comes to the conformity assessment procedure. Even more so as in many cases, AI system developers might develop applications for general use, which makes it difficult to think already in terms of use cases and related obligations for developers. This is an area that might need further clarification in the proposed regulation. One issue that I would like to hear more about that I find particularly interesting is that of making the assessment reports public and to actually involve the public in a feedback process, be it online or through hearings. Transparency, accountability and trustworthiness are indeed among the most valuable objectives we should aim for in regulating AI and especially when it's uh, related to public authorities. We see growing demand and push for the uptake of AI and digitalization in general by public administration, even in the intentions of the commission itself and specific chapters and envelopes of budget has been dedicated to it in the uh, resilience uh, 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 plans, uh, uh, recovery and resilience plans presented by our member states. I'm curious to know how uh, this will develop. And now you also you see uh, uh, this drive intertwined with the time frame needed for the procedure to be completed, especially in the high risk cases. So uh, with all these considerations on different aspects of the topic, I, I want to reiterate my congratulations for this work. And uh, I think it will be very important to keep in touch, to update uh, each other and to uh, exchange views, especially towards the work that will take some time to uh, finally decide on, on the regulation and in general to establish a European model for AI as uh, we, we hope for it can be a force for a public good and for global understanding and trust, which again, I want to, to say this word, trust is the crucial uh, point when we deal uh, with AI and, and the public. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Brando, thank you very much indeed for that insightful and excellent presentation from the perspective of the EU. The EU initiatives in this area are really interesting. And I and a number of other people have also studied those in some detail. Um, and I think that the draft legislation emanating from the EP is a contribution to the debate about the way forward in this area. So thank you very much indeed for attending and for giving us your time. I now pass over to Mark. So Mark and Jens Peter are going to give, as it were, the internal perspective on the ELI project. Mark will address um, the way in which the structure of the project has developed and will also speak to some of the salient differences and similarities with the EU initiative. And then Jens Peter will focus in a more laser-like way on one of the very, very key articles of our modern rules, which is Article 6. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. I try to share my screen. Hope this is working now. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So um, I will start the presentation of the of the draft as um, Paul said. Um, explaining the, the the main structure, I I would would like to to say firstly that uh, the slides are quite detailed. We I will not explain in details every uh, item in the slides, but all participants should have the, had the possibility to receive and look at the slides, and that's uh, more an introduction to uh, the slides that I will do than. Uh, just a uh, very detailed comment to every uh, point in the slide. So uh, we uh, share the presentation with Jens Peter. I mean, uh, I start with the general structure and some comments on differences between the um, EU proposal and uh, the model rules. And um, 
and yes, Pedro will focus on on one of the main article in the model rules on um, Article Six and the, the Annex Four of the of the draft. So that the choices we made to uh, highlight some specific features of the model rules. Uh, I'd like to say uh, that we will start the process of validation of the uh, model rules by VLI by the end of uh, September, beginning of the October. So there will be uh, 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 most likely um, a, a document from official, uh, an official document from VLI uh, for these model rules very soon. So all members of VLI will have a say on, on this. So, uh, uh, a graph showing the um, uh, structure of the uh, impact uh, assessment and the different steps. Uh, first, we start with the design of the system. Then we will have a screening process, which is to evaluate whether the, there, is, there are attached risk to this um, uh, to the system which is proposed, S a scoping for defining the impact assessment, what are the features, what are the features to be assessed, to be examined by, um, by uh, the, the impact assessment, and then uh, the production of the impact assessment report. And in the context of high-risk system, we uh, developed a bit more the um, uh, possibilities for a review of the system, having an expert audit board in charge of analyzing the uh, uh, impact assessment. Uh, and as it was said, a very important step is also public participation and uh, an evaluation by the implementing authority in charge of um, taking on board all the comments and all the things there. I just want to stress one point in this, is that, as it was said, um, with these systems, we are um, in, a, in, in, a, in a movement that is um, techno technology driven, tech, and that means that we, we will have new uh, approaches, new tools, and it's very difficult to develop technical knowledge in this field which is updated, which is up to date. And uh, this is why it is important to have, uh, to have both things, expert audit with some experts and dependent experts doing the assessment and also public participation, which is a way to uh, develop the, some kind of knowledge of, um, about these systems in civil society. And I think it's important to know and to acknowledge the fact that in IT, uh, there is a, a big community of developers. If you think about the uh, open source um, developments and all the things related to that, uh, we cannot say that the civil society is just, uh, uh, is, is, is just uh, without any knowledge on, on, on these systems. And we, we can also think of, of uh, organizations um, uh, developing uh, some policies in, in the domain of, uh, of freedoms and things like that. So that's why public participation in this domain is very important. And then evaluation, and then publication, and then uh, pot potentially you will have uh, the repetition of the assessment under some uh, specific conditions. So that's the main line for the development of the impact assessments for these um, in the model rules uh, for public administration uh, decision systems. So uh, following uh, the uh, structure uh, that I basically explain. Uh, we have moved a bit from last time and uh, the structure has developed um, in different chapters to be uh, more clear. And um, in particular, we have introduced uh, several um, items. One thing is to to uh, identify what is the standard impact assessment procedure and then 
the specific provisions which will be added to the standard uh, assessment procedure uh, in the context of high-risk system. And uh, another uh, part dealing with accountability, introducing the uh, concept of super supervisory authority and a specific um, article dealing with complaints and legal protection. So, and uh, development also of annexes. But um, uh, I, I'm not entering into too many details because uh, that will take too, too long. I want to, to move now to uh, the main differences between the uh, proposal and uh, the proposal from the Commission and the current ALI project. First thing, we are dealing in the model rules um, with decision making in the domain of administrations where the uh, EU proposal is more based on uh, product saf safety approach, at least prima facie, this is more a pro product safety uh, approach, uh, not targeting specifically uh, public administrations, but uh, if you look at it uh, carefully and specifically with Annex 3 of the regulation, you have the feeling that the most important part is really uh, when administrations are uh, dealing with these systems. So uh, a, a specific difference, and I, we believe that there is a need to have specific rules for our administrations and public administrations because the public is uh, supposed to um, have a service which is uh, done by administration uh, with a strong uh, trust and uh, um, capacity to believe that the administration is doing the things rightly. So that's uh, main, one main difference. The uh, other difference is that we've chosen not to, um, to be very specific on the technologies involved. It's very difficult to uh, have a list of technologies uh, which will not be uh, a, a list which is very stable due to the fact that technology is evolved, but more um, based on the risk evaluation. We are talking about algorithmic decisions, systems that provide automatic decisions um, for the administrations or support the, administ the administration in, in taking decisions. But uh, what is key is to have this risk assessment whether there is a risk or not, and to, uh, to uh, open the, the, the need for an impact assessment in this context. And um, last uh, element I wanted to stress is this uh, public participation. I'm not, I'm not saying too much on, on that, but we can come back on that on, uh, if there are questions on, on it. I'd like to, to, to say that uh, we've been inspired a lot by um, the development of um, environmental law and the domain of environmental law has been uh, something which is uh, very inspiring in, 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 the, in this field. There are big similarities. Uh, the, uh, one, of, one of the similar, similarities is the fact that the technology is involved in, in many development of projects and uh, with little knowledge of the uh, real impact and doing the impact assessment as a way to uh, secure, to, to, to check first what we know, what we know uh, with less details. And public participation is, is, is playing a strong role also in the capacity to um, collect the, uh, the feedbacks by uh, the views of the public, which are extremely helpful in the development of, um, of projects in the domain of environmental law. And we believe also that this is key in the domain of um, uh, AI and algorithmic decisions uh, used by administration, the need for a public debate, for a democratic debate on, um, in this. Uh, so that's uh, for a very, very brief presentation on that. And um, I uh, stopped my presentation here, uh, giving the floor to uh, Paul for the next steps. Mark, thank you very much indeed for that very helpful 
and insightful presentation giving an overview of the main features of the model rules combined with some of the salient differences between the rules and the EU um, initiatives. So um, just to reiterate what Mark said at the outset of his presentation, exigencies of time have obviously meant that we cannot go into great detail in relation to all the rules. You have had an opportunity to consider the document in advance and of course, we would welcome any, any comments that anyone would like to make. And of course, even if you haven't had an opportunity to look at the matter in detail before now, any comments that you have hereafter can of course be channeled through the ELI and we would happily take them into account. So let me now pass over to Jens Peter, who is going to look at one of the really core features of the model rules. Which is, an, which is Article 6 and the um, combination of Article 6 with Annex 4. Jens Peter, thank you so much. So thank you, Paul, very much for uh, introducing myself. And as mentioned already by Mark, as well as Paul, I will deal with some details of the impact assessment report, which is covered by Article 6, and I will put it into context, into the normative context, so to say. And as you can see here, and as mentioned by Mark already, the impact assessment report is part of the standard impact assessment procedure. So that will be done with each uh, system which is under the obligation to um, be assessed uh, throughout this standard procedure. And the final, one of the results of the impact assessment report will be whether or not the uh, system in place is one of high risk or not. And if it's um, evaluated as high risk, then the other rules with regard to expert audit and public participation will apply. Um, the second point I would like highlight uh, with this slide here is that the impact assessment report or the article six on this report is a complemented by uh, the Annex 4, which is the kind of questionnaire for this uh, report in order to make it more easily uh, for the uh, authorities to um, con comply with our obligations um, under Article 6. To come to some of the uh, contents of uh, this Article 6, um, this slide shall highlight um, the overall uh, approach to some extent. Um, the first thing is that uh, we have, or what we are trying to achieve is to find the right balance and optimization of maximizing on one hand side, on the one hand side, the benefits may be provided by artificial intelligence for public administration, as well as minimizing the risk caused by such sort of uh, artificial intelligence. And in some cases, even avoiding unacceptable risks, which is obviously also important. And to do this, we highlight here very much first the idea, what is the purpose of the IA system in order uh, or with regard to the objectives of public administration and how will it be effective and how efficient, efficient will that system be? So this is on the benefit side, whereas of course the impact of the systems on various risks and the measures to ensure that these risks will not uh, be um, really uh, uh, take on board. Um, that is, so to say, the other side of the of a balanced system here. To go into some more details here, you will see um, what is uh, important for description. I won't go into the details uh, at this time, but you will have the opportunity to ask any question uh, in our uh, in the last part of this webinar, uh, which is probably more important for you or more interesting here is um, our structure uh, about these uh, risk impact, uh, which uh, we try to structure into three categories. And the first one is, which is something which is mainly the, um, the, the focus of many discussions with regard uh, to AI systems, 
which is uh, the impact on individual rights. And of course, this is extremely important, but it's not the whole story, so to say. Uh, we also would like to take on board the more systemic uh, risk, which may also be caused by AI system, a point which is, for instance, uh, highlighted uh, by the um, Council of Europe and their report, as well as uh, in the uh, Digital Services Act, there is also some sort of uh, assessment of systemic risk. And I think this is extremely important point of to make here. And the last thing, which is something very specific, if you try to introduce a system into the administration, you also have to think about the people who have to deal with that within the administration. So what is going to change in the system? What are the impact on the, on the staff and so on and so forth? Um, and then, as mentioned earlier, we try to maximize the benefits as well as minimize the identified risks. And so it's very important to take a look after identifying uh, the risk then to take measures how to ensure this sort of maximization and minimization on the other side as well. And of course, here we also highlight all the typical points uh, which are under discussions uh, through the last years with regard to, um, uh, to ensure human agency, so on and so forth, the other things mentioned here. We hoped that we put it into a rather systemic uh, correct thing or uh, structure here and hope uh, that this will at least improve a little bit the discussions on this topic. Um, the next point I would then talk about is um, is about um, the, the conclusions which are to make. So first you have this sort of assessment and the next step must be some decision to take whether or not you want to, uh, to uh, deploy the system or not and how to use it. And so we need a concluding determination of a risk level. And if it's high risk, then it's going on to the expert and public participation. And uh, the next thing which must be uh, discussed within the agency is um, an overall assessment of the necessity and proportionality of this system. And it may be that there are also reasonable alternatives, which is something we learned from environmental impact assessment, but the alternatives are the important things sometimes to discuss. And the last point, of course, must be a statement on the legality. So I hope that I could give you some impression about uh, our approach with regard to this report. And uh, the last point I would like to make here today is the outlook. As mentioned already by Mark and uh, Paul, we are hopefully more or less at the end of this project, and, but still some tasks are to be done. Um, we uh, are discussing the, um, the wording of Article 3, which is important with regard to the coordination with other procedures, be it the uh, the data protection uh, assessment, as well as with regard to the draft AI regulation as covered by uh, MIP uh, Ben Fay. Um, one point I would highlight here, which because it's uh, very deeply connected with Article 6, is the Annex 4, which is this assessment list, this, que this uh, questionnaire. And here we uh, have already listed a long list of questions uh, taken from various sources and uh, we are contemplating or considering how to, um, um, to avoid unacceptance or hesitance uh, by, uh, uh, by all the legislators. We want to have acceptance, otherwise these model rules will be nice paper, but no one will take it on board. And for that reason, we are discussing whether we uh, draw up a minimum list and an extent list in order to get acceptance as far as possible. And the last point here is uh, that we hope to be to have a final version ready to vote on uh, at the end of this year. So thank you very much for your um, for your attention and I now hand over again to Paul. Jens Peter, thank you so much for the elucidation and presentation of one of the key features of our model rules, which is Article 6 and the conjunction of Article 6 and Annex 4. Um, 
just to reiterate what, Ma, uh, what Jens Peter said, the panel spent a great deal of time working through various drafts of what is now Article 6, because the content of the impact assessment report is at the very heart of what we are doing and at the very heart of the contribution which we hope that these model rules can make to the resolution of issues concerning with art, concern with artificial intelligence. So let me now, let us now move on to our final speaker. We're really grateful for Peggy Valka um, to have taken the time to join our webinar. It is an attestation to, of the importance of the problem that we're focusing on, which is artificial intelligence, that it should be receiving the attention not only of the EU, but also of the Council of Europe. And Peggy is in a, is a, in a tremendous position to explain to us the initiatives being taken by the Council of Europe because she is the vice chair of the Council of Europe's ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence, known by the acronym of KHI. So Peggy, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul, for having invited me. It's a true pleasure to take part in this panel. And I would like to start congratulating the panel members who have prepared this document which is of excellent quality and indeed, as you rightly mentioned, uh, addresses a key uh, aspect of the deployment and the use of artificial intelligence systems and then notably decisions that help us determine and take uh, decisions uh, in uh, public administration. I've prepared a couple of slides to guide the audience through the various documents and there they are coming up. Um, so I do not speak on behalf of the whole of the Council of Europe, but only its ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence, CAHAI, which, um, and as you can see that on the next slide is an ad hoc committee um, set up by the committee of ministers of the Council of Europe in September 2019 with a two-year mandate. Um, so our mandate ends in December of this year. Um, and we have as mission to examine the feasibility and the elements of, of a legal framework um, for the deployments, the design, and the use of artificial intelligence based on the standards of the Council of Europe in relation to human rights, democracy, and rule of law. Um, so it's, this ad hoc committee consists of obviously the representatives of for the 47 member states of the Council of Europe, but also representatives of observer states like Canada and Israel, Japan, Mexico, United States and Holy See, also representatives of other bodies of the Council of Europe. Why? Because the Council of Europe um, counts many different pillars, many different uh, specialized bodies which have been working on artificial intelligence and algorithmic decision-making systems, I think for over 10 years now. Um, and they have produced a number of interesting studies, a number of uh, interesting soft law documents like recommendations and declarations over the last years, which unfortunately, I don't have the time to present all of them. I will focus on what Kahai is doing. But they obviously also uh, sit on Kahai in order to bring in their expertise. We also have representatives of the European Commission, for instance, the UNESCO, the OECD, from the private sector, and also from civil society and academia. And it has been mentioned before, public participation is very important when we deal with AI. So also uh, within Kahai, we try to uh, establish a multi-stakeholder discussion on uh, the various topics that we are discussing. Um, Eli, um, well, unfortunately, Kahai's mandate is ending soon, but uh, I would, if there is a follow up, I would recommend Eli to also apply for observer status. It's explained on Kahai's website how to do this. It's very simple. Uh, we also have, for instance, the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, the International Bar Association, the Law Society of Ireland as observers in our meetings as they have applied for observer status. Now on the next slide, you can see that uh, the big group of Kahai is um, 
split in different working groups eh, on a voluntary basis. So members of CAHAI could subscribe to one or more of the working groups, which convene more often than uh, the whole group of CAHAI. Uh, the plenary meetings are limited to one, two, this year, three meetings per year. Um, but we work in smaller groups. There is the policy development group, the CAHAI PDG, mandated to, um, which was mandated to prepare a feasibility study, which we published last year in December, and where the conclusion was that a legal framework at the level of the Council of Europe would ideally consist of a combination of binding and non-binding instruments. And when it comes to the binding instruments that for the moment we don't have a legal instrument at the level of the Council of Europe or comparable level that fills all the gaps. And therefore that our recommendation would be to come up with a transversal binding instrument that would lay down, anchor key principles on the use of AI in all sectors. And then that can be further particularized in soft law instruments for particular sectors. This year, CAHAI PDG is focusing on two documents, which I will uh, present in a minute, because those are most relevant for the work that um, this ELI panel has been doing. The second work, working group, the LFG uh, group, of which I'm one of the co-chairs, focuses on um, drafting elements that could go into a possible convention should the Committee of Ministers decide next year that this is indeed the way to go, uh, I, namely to um, move towards the direction of a new Council of Europe Convention on AI. And the CAHAI COG, the Consultations and Outreach Group, has done various uh, launched various initiatives to engage the various stakeholders in this whole exercise. Earlier this year, there was a large public consultation uh, of which the uh, outcome was discussed at the plenary meeting of CAHAI in the summer. Now on the next slide, um, you can find the two documents uh, produced by the PDG. They are still in the draft form, but produced by PDG that relates on the one hand to the use of AI in the public sector and on the other hand relate to a methodology for a human rights, democracy and rule of law impact assessment of AI systems. So I think those two documents come very close and also go in the same direction as what uh, the ELI panel on uh, impact assessment of ADM systems used by public administration has uh, been producing. So the first document is a policy guidance document that first of all lists examples of use cases of AI applications in the various member states of the Council of Europe, reviewing the benefits and the risks of the use of AI in the public sector and formulating concrete policy recommendations for public actors that seek to adopt AI. So we formulate um, in that document um, very precise uh, there, we cannot, we don't call them articles or rules like, like in the ELI document, but policy recommendations for the various phases in the development of AI system. And for instance, in the design phase, and I will now highlight some of the similarities and differences between uh, our document and your document. So we also highlight that it's important to think about the analyze and um, to, to analyze the problem that you want to solve with the system to identify, for instance, the data sets that you will use uh, for, to train the, and validate the AI system, to make presumptions that underlie the design of the system explicit, to involve also the intended users of the system and consider their capabilities and wherever possible, choose for an open and transparent design. In the procurement phase, and this is crucial because this is the, how public sector can, can in a, to an important extent, steer uh, uh, the development uh, of, of AI in, in, in the right direction. So in the procurement phase, it's also an important to examine applicable legislation and policy measures. This was all also highlighted in the, in the presentation before. Um, we also um, recommend that in that phase, a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder approach should be adopted and that the impact on public accountability uh, should be carefully considered, meaning if you work with a service provider not willing to give you all the relevant information to assess your system, then maybe you shouldn't work with that service provider, right? So if third parties won't, don't want to comply with those information obligations, um, then uh, 
choose a different one and, and, and hopefully the market uh, will, will provide for alternatives there. In the development phase, it will be important to establish documentation, logging processes, to put in place appropriate testing and validation uh, mechanisms, to set up data governance mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. Also consider risks of unequal treatment, uh, impact on gender equality. And this is a, a particular issue on which uh, uh, Kahai is also um, working closely. Uh, gender equality is, is a very important aspect that we look into. And then for the deployment phase, it's important to also allow the carrying out of audits, independent audits. Uh, that's also stressed in our document. That um, we also recommend the setting up of public registers for AI systems used in the public sector, the establishment of feedback mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the recommendations we give also to uh, public sector uh, actors that want to implement AI tools is to carry out a human rights, democracy, rule of law impact assessment. And then we come to the second document that, um, and I would say that your document is a kind of combination of our two documents. So in our, um, what we call Huderia uh, document, uh, we have now for the moment outlined the steps that um, are part of such an impact assessment, how this can be linked to a broader human rights compliance um, uh, mechanisms that we, that we, um, that, that are existing uh, because of the United Nations, as well as the Council of Europe has worked intensely on human rights compliance by public and private actors before, um, how to link it to, to setting up uh, systems to remedy potential shortcomings or risks that have been uh, identified. And this document um, is now being turned also into concrete, a concrete questionnaire by the Alan Turing Institute. And so, as I said, those documents, which are available online, everyone can consult them, but they are draft documents that have been discussed by the plenary meeting of CAHAI in the summer and will be revised in autumn. So on the next slide, you can see that um, the, what the work of PDG is complementary and should link to what the LFG is doing. So the LFG focuses on um, setting out or identifying the necessary elements that we will need should the Committee of Ministers uh, take the decision to move in the direction of a binding convention. So we have reflected, discussed within our working group possible provisions on the purpose, the scope, the definitions um, of, of such a possible convention, how to classify uh, risk or how to classify systems depending on the risk. Here we have, I think, an element that combines uh, the initiative of the European Commission, the Council of Europe, and also the ELI approach, and that is the risk-based approach. Right? So we, of course, do not uh, overly want to burden um, systems that um, that are neutral or that do not pose significant threats uh, to human rights or to safety. Um, so we've also identified the key principles, basic principles that should guide the development and the use of AI and how to turn those into binding obligations, what kind of safeguards should be put in place and what should be, and here I come again uh, to the link with the ELI document, how can we uh, what are the specific requirements we need for the public sector? So in uh, the document that we produced earlier this year and that we called a preliminary draft model provisions document uh, that provided a kind of a mock-up or a skeleton for a possible convention, we proposed to pay specific attention to the public sector. And we distinguish within that chapter um, provisions for law enforcement, um, provisions for uh, the judiciary, provisions for uh, public administration, and then specific requirements uh, for election periods. And then evidently there will also be provisions on supervision and, and enforcement. So this is what the LFG is working on. Um, together with the work of the PDG, this will all be combined in a final deliverable to be presented to the CAHAI plenary meeting um, in December. And what will happen then? Um, well, on the next slide, you can see I have highlighted uh, some of the, I would say, um, political statements that have been made recently. And so there are a lot of colleagues stressing 
while the decision has not yet been taken or what will happen next year, others are referring uh, to uh, the Committee of Ministers meeting in Hamburg earlier this year, where the Committee of Ministers has actually invited its deputies and the ministers of the member states to focus on the possible legal framework, which can be composed of a binding legal instrument of a transversal character that would then anchor common principles for AI. And then in specific uh, or specifically with a view to have negotiations on the transversal instrument started by the next meeting of the Committee of Ministers in May 22. So many of the colleagues read there that treaty negotiations will start, whereas others are a bit more skeptical or a bit more prudent. Also, in uh, the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, which is the other um, uh, political body of the Council of Europe where parliamentary representatives of national parliaments uh, sit, they have also lent or uh, already explicitly lent their support for a convention on artificial intelligence uh, in their resolution and recommendations adopted in October of last year. So it's, I would say it's quite likely that the Council of Europe will move in the direction of a convention on AI, but this is a decision that Kahai cannot take. We're not mandated, mandated to take that decision. We can only give our input to the Committee of Ministers and it's uh, up to them to decide what will happen next year. Will then Kahai continue its mandate? Will it get a new mandate or will there be a new steering committee? This is, again, also open uh, for discussion. So there are a lot of similarities between what the Kahai PDG and the LFG are doing with regard to AI in the public sector. Our scope of application is, I think, a bit broader as we, since we speak of AI systems and not only um, decision-making systems, but when we go to the, I would say, the hardcore obligations, uh, for instance, the model provision that the LFG has been working on, there, we do indeed focus um, a lot of our provisions on uh, algorithmic decision-making systems because we, like you, believe that those are indeed uh, the, the, the systems where the, the most likely risks for human rights, democracy, and, and we also uh, look specifically at rule of law, um, uh, come to uh, the fore. And I'm very, let me start uh, or end, let me start, no, let me end by saying um, that we do appreciate uh, the, the fact that also in your documents, a lot of attention has been paid to public participation, because that's also indeed uh, one of the key um, uh, messages uh, that we try to reflect in our work. Engage uh, the public, engage stakeholders, because this is the only way uh, to indeed um, detect the different uh, risks uh, involved. Thank you very much for having listened to me and I'm open to any questions you may have. Peggy, thank you very much for that very clear and excellent exposition of the work being done, the very important work being done by the Council of Europe in this area. And uh, it's very interesting to see the pathways which CAHI has been treading as it were and the way in which it is shaping and has been shaped by the political process in the Council of Europe. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Both, I mean, it's interesting in, the, in and of itself, and it's really helpful for us in the ELI in taking our work forward. And we've drawn inspiration from some of your documentation, as we stated already. So um, we now have time for uh, Q and A, and um, there's a number of interesting questions which have been posed. Um, so let me begin by addressing these questions. So the first question, and I would like to actually pose this one, I think, both to Jay, uh, Jens, Peter, and Peggy, in turn, is. A question which is really an endemic issue in this area for any institution which is trying to um, deal with issues about uh, AI, which is the question is framed in terms of proportionality. And the essence of the question is this, it's um, how far does proportionality play a role with regard to the degree and intensity of the impact assessment 
And the nub of the questions is that, um, is that small administrations may have limited budget and limited time in which to undertake the impact assessment, but they might also gain a lot from a lot economically and in other ways from the use of AI systems and system citizens could also profit by being served more expeditiously, more, uh, more quickly. So I wonder whether from the perspective of the airline, the perspective of the Council of Europe, Jens Peter and Peggy could address that question. Jens Peter. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this is, as you mentioned, Paul, already a really important question. And as we are focusing on both sides, profits or benefits as well as risk, uh, it's important to gain the risk uh, or to exploit the risk, uh, the, sorry, to exploit the benefits. And uh, this may be in many, many cases, a small administration uh, who are in need of uh, using AI because they have just limited human resources. And um, to, to address this problem, one of our um, instruments may be the screening process. Uh, because in the screening process, you ask whether or not a, a specific system is high risk or not. And in, uh, if you have a case that is that you have a system which has already been um, assessed by other administrations, and you're just re-implementing the same system to your very specific smaller administration, then of course you can also use uh, the knowledge gained through the um, the, the, the previous. Uh, impact assessment. And I think that would be one, um, one good option uh, to support a smaller uh, administration uh, with some, so to say, lead uh, uh, impact assessments, as well as, of course, other sorts of support given by central government to such sort of a smaller administration. Thank you. Thank you, Jens Peter. Peggy. I fully sympathize with that question. Um, and I think it might be a burden in the beginning when people are not yet used to this kind of uh, assessments, um, smaller administrations may struggle. However, I don't think that limited um, bandwidth can be an excuse to put in place high uh, impact uh, systems uh, or high risk systems without proper assessment. So I think that the uh, necessity proportionality of, of uh, question do we need an assessment doesn't depend on does the administration have sufficient uh, staff on board to carry out such an assessment but what are the risks uh, for 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 human rights uh, and and for uh, democracy and the systemic risks and undoubtedly there will be specialized bodies put in place or experts put in place that do this exercise um, in one administration and then another um, like we've seen with the dpias and the data protection uh, sphere uh, after the um, general data protection regulation um, entered into force there was also um, a lot of concern that this would create quite some um, yeah efforts, uh, additional effort for, from companies and public sector uh, bodies, but um, this assessment, I mean, the more often you do such kind of assessment, the better or the more efficient you become in it. There are tools that uh, somehow automate uh, these questions. And I think if you allow me, um, Mr. Chairman, to, to tackle immediately one of the next questions, where do you see the boundaries between classic data processing, processing and AI? There is, of course, indeed um, quite a close link when it comes to personal data uh, being used for AI systems. But a lot of AI systems um, built on non-personal data uh, and, and uh, a lot of administrations uh, have uh, information about the weather or traffic. Um, and so that kind of uh, tools or tools built on that data also need to respect certain principles. But of course, we, we um, are aware uh, that uh, existing regulations and rules in data protection, personal data protection are highly relevant also for some of the um, 
key principles that we want to achieve in general with, with uh, regulation on AI. Peggy, thank you so much. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next question, which I think actually is the question really addressed to Peggy as well. Well, it is, um, it is directly uh, for Peggy. And the question here is how far is the Council of Europe coordinating activities with the EU in order not to duplicate or create discrepancies in the legal framework in this sphere? Again, an important question. I mean, it's terrific that both of, a, of the premier regional groupings within Europe, the Council of Europe and the EU, are both realizing the importance of this issue and both working on it, but then that gives rise necessarily to coordination problems and overlap problems. So Peggy, over to you. As far as Kahai is concerned, it's in our mandate to take into account the work of other international organizations, so not only the European Union, for instance, also the United Nations. Um, is there close interaction? Yes, in all of our meetings, plenary meetings, there is a representative of the European Commission and from the side of the Council of Europe, there's regularly somebody participating in meetings in Brussels, though there is, I would say, quite intense interaction. Um, and um, this not only goes for CAHAI, but also for the Council of Europe in general. And so if there are initiatives from the sectoral uh, bodies of the Council of Europe that are relevant for AI, there is also um, a strong interaction with representatives from the European Commission. Thank you. Um, so I think the next question is really one probably for Mark. Uh, it's been touched on already, but again, it's a really important question uh, and an insightful question. And the question is, we've been processing electronic data in public administration for around four decades. Where do you see the boundaries between classic data processing on the one hand and artificial intelligence on the other? Mark, would you like to perhaps proffer some thoughts on that? Yes, I, I, I don't see boundaries, uh, to be honest. I, I see a, a continuity of techniques. And if you look at the next one of the proposed um, AI regulation uh, from the Commission, you will see uh, deep learning techniques. When we think, uh, we think of um, AI, most of the time people refer to automatic uh, learning and uh, neural networks. Um, deep learning techniques, but also rule-based um, systems, which were more in favor in the 90s, like uh, expert systems. But you also see in the same annex statistics, statistical methods. And uh, if you think of something which was really something, the, the one of the examples um, of, um, tech, of um, let's say, algorithmic decision systems used by administration, which is the COMPASS system uh, in the US that was used, that is used for assess assessing the risk of, um, of uh, for, um, for uh, criminals. Uh, this um, the, this compact, COMPASS tool is based on statistics, is not based on uh, deep learning and things like that. And I think that this continuity between uh, some of the classic tools or so-called classic tools, not necessarily uh, uh, very classic, you can create statistics in a way which is um, not necessarily uh, totally uh, classic, up to uh, the deep learning systems makes it difficult to, um, uh, ask, to, to, to propose some rules only based on specific techniques because if you um, are uh, developing something completely new, which is not in one of these uh, three box deep learning rule based system or statistics, then you may enter in a, in a, in a, in a, in a system which is completely uh, outside of the scope of the regulation. 
but has a strong impact on, on, on people. And you, you can be sure, um, as a judge, I, 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 I'm always cautious with definitions because you can be sure that it will be argued in court that you are not entering in, in the definition and the very definition of, of AI uh, with the tool you, you are developing. Where the, 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 the main issue is really to make sure that uh, there is no discrimination, that the tools are providing with, uh, uh, with good quality the, 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 the decisions that are uh, to be um, to be taken by the tools. So, um, so to me, it's it's a bit dangerous to to try to uh, focus on a very precise definition uh, in this domain. As uh, Jens Peter said, the screening part in uh, the model rules we propose is a way to ensure some proportionality uh, between the the, the 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 systems developed and the risk and uh, to have uh, this complete assessment and that's why we are the, um, uh, we are referring to algorithmic decision systems mark uh, thank you very much and i think actually i think the next question is probably for you as well um uh the um, if JP has some thoughts on this, then that would be great too. I'm sure he does. And the question is, and it's very, again a very interesting one. So in the timeline presented by Mark, has it been considered whether you should introduce, a, quote, a step zero in the timeline before beginning with the design in order to open for public participation, collect different ideas or approaches to the problem? or the politics that's being addressed. Perhaps it would be helpful to introduce this previous step before the design of the project has started and is already pointed or pointing in a definite direction. So, um, Mark, maybe you have a, a, um, a first take on this and if JP would like to add, then that would be great. Yes, if, just briefly, if we uh, follow the line uh, um, developed in the domain of environmental law, there is this, uh, this um, informal consultations before you start a project uh, in some specific cases. Uh, it's not really, um, at least not in the uh, EU, um, EU law, um, EU environmental law, but uh, this, this could be a very useful uh, step. But at, at, at the same time, uh, we try to uh, limit the complexity to, um, to what is potentially manageable. And even with limiting uh, the complexity, uh, the uh, steps are uh, numerous in the, in, the, in the model rules. So there is a balance to find between uh, uh, having these possibilities for the public to engage in the process and be earliest is, um, is the best, but uh, also to balance with the complexity. Maybe uh, Jens Peter, if you want to complete. I would just like to add uh, one point in, in this regard. Um, in the report, we asked the authorities to explain how they develop the system and uh, how they try to minimize the risk. And so it's for them to find the best way how to deal with with such sorts of risk. And one way may be to introduce uh, such a um, such as point zero or step zero in order to be as early as possible um, to have the input from the outside. And a second point would be in our scoping process, we have also, as you will probably know from the environmental impact assessment, the opportunity for the, for the authority to ask also uh, the public, which are the most important uh, topics we need to uh, assess in our assessment report. So I think that's something which is near, at least, uh, to a step zero you mentioned. Thank you. Um, I'm mindful of exigencies of time, but I think we do have time to address uh, a couple of more questions. Um, so again, an interesting and insightful question. And I think 
maybe, I mean, this could go to anyone, but I think let's take Peggy's view on this. So the question is put, how do we ensure that the results of IT systems with artificial intelligence are also traceable? There are many decades of experience in how IT systems for bookkeeping, accounting, and quality testing are checked by specialized auditors. Can we learn from it? Peggy, I wonder if you have any views on this, and I wonder if KHI has um, thought about this issue at all in its deliberations and working. Absolutely. Um, can we learn from them? Um, uh, there are standardization bodies which have been active in, in various fields, but there are also the, I would, I call them the technical organizations like IEEE, for instance, with, uh, they are also represented in, in, in the CAHI, um, and they are working actively on specifying uh, the, the kind of um, assessment procedures um, for, uh, in various areas like transparency, explainability, et cetera, of AI systems for the engineers. So I think the, in order to put this right, we will, we will need um, a collaboration between legal people, the engineers, and then people who are very experienced with, with compliance assessment um, in order to um, yeah, put in place systems that, that are reasonable and that um, are able to detect risks, but without overly uh, burden um, uh, the administrations or other actors that need to go through these assessments. Now that sounds simple, but it's, it's hard yeah, to put in place uh, such a system, but it will be a collaboration from different actors. And this uh, links to the next question, may associations that for instance represent towns and cities uh, set up a specialized department. I think this could be indeed the way to go. It, it's, and I'm speaking now as a researcher, we have a smart city project in which we work, for instance, with uh, the Flemish Association of Cities um, uh, and Communities in order to set up a, a system for a data protection impact assessment in the context of smart cities, where, by the way, also on the base of Article 39 of the uh, GDPR, you should, uh, in certain circumstances, consult with your citizens. And so the um, there will be, this will yeah, be further um, specified in the future and will um, hopefully lead to practical results. Peggy, thank you. Um, so very quickly, given the exigencies of time, um, let me, so you've addressed uh, the question about associations representing towns and cities, thank you. Um, and then we have a question from someone from Poland, um, uh, and it's an important question. Where and the question is: AI is a very broad concept. The issue of controlling high-risk AI is not debatable. But should we not also put other codes used in administration under control? And the questioner, the person writing the question, says, "I'm from Poland." And I strongly fear a government administration equipped with AI tools for verifying citizens' activities and positioning them. It is one thing to use algorithms positively for the benefit of society, but there is a risk of use um, against certain social groups. Uh, this is a question of considerable importance. Um, normative importance, which in many ways goes beyond the remit of the particular studies that are being undertaken by ELI and by the Council of Europe. If I might just abuse my position from the chair for a moment, just to say, I think everyone in, on this panel and I think everyone in this Zoom room would be aware of some of the difficulties with the application of the rule of law in Poland, and I say no more than that, other than the fact that it's a well-attested and well-discussed issue. And I think, I mean, I think my take on this particular issue is that there, the, the, both the Council of Europe study and the ELI study, and indeed the EU study, all address this question in part because 
they all incorporate a focus on the protection of human rights and the way in which AI may impact on human rights. And insofar as that issue is raised in the question, uh, in the question that I've just read out, then it seems to me that all the models would address that issue as one of the issues to be considered. At the same time, I think, certainly my view on this would be that there are problems concerned with the application of intelligence gaining uh, tools, including AI, which transcend what we are trying to do with the ELI model rules, or what we can do. And to put it very uh, bluntly, if a government is minded to misuse its power um, and to use AI tools to misuse its power, then um, we have a problem which is over and beyond the sort of thing that can be probably captured by model rules. But um, maybe uh, other members of the panel would have uh, their own take on that. But um, I'm just mindful of the fact that we've gone five minutes over. I don't know. Um, uh, Susanna, do we are we allowed to take a couple of more minutes or we are going to be, as they say, cut off in our prime? Oh well, um, I would assume that we I, I would assume that we can take a couple of more minutes um, uh, and um, then uh, address um, at least, one or two more of the interesting questions. So we have a question. Uh, next question is that the ELI model rules on impact assessment are purely procedural rules based on a dichotomy between high risk or not, but there's no description of the risks as if these procedural rules could be applied to any risk according to the circumstance. Is a reference the relato to international uh, to supranational instruments or to the described Hudera approach described by Peggy Valka envisaged. After all, the ELI project will not provide a neutral system of evaluation as this would be at odds with the real purpose of the rules. Perhaps JP, you could have uh, a shot at that one. I will try, although it's a big question. <laughs> Yeah. Um, first, you're absolutely correct. We try to focus on the procedure side. And uh, on the other side, we try to organize at least a little bit the focus on the procedure with regard to various types of risks, which is individual or more social or more within the, um, the staff or the administration itself. So I think to some extent, we try to organize a little bit the discussion, which is, has been done uh, through the last years. And maybe that's also for, with some help with regard to more substantial discussions. But we are not setting standards. And probably that's not even possible uh, with regard if you try to be really open for any sort of new uh, system they are deploying. Of course, as we know from the, uh, from the draft regulation, there may be some, uh, uh, some things or some instruments which or uses of AI which you which are just unacceptable, and then it's for other legal instruments to identify such sorts of unacceptable risks. This is nothing for an impact assessment. I think that's the same in the field of environmental law, but it helps to inform the discussion and to um, to uh, really identify the high risk systems and the high risk you have to uh, manage. Thank you. And I, I the, the last point, um, I would be very, very much uh, like to discuss with you uh, why the, the system is not really neutral. Of course, it's not neutral that we are saying uh, we would accept to some extent AI systems. But on the other side, if you just make a moratorium, it's also not, no, not very neutral. So. We try to be as neutral as possible, or at least balanced. And that's a good point for a for lawyer, I think. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I have had my instructions from higher powers that I think that we 
need to terminate our discussion, um, even though I'd be very happy. Uh, I think it's been really interesting and stimulating. If I could conclude then by thanking all the participants for joining this webinar, and I'd like to thank those who pose really excellent questions and insightful questions. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the members of the panel for taking part, Peggy and Brando for joining and giving us such interesting external assessments. And of course, JP, J, Jens Peter and Mark, um, friends and colleagues who have been taking this project forward. We will be producing a final document for, uh, for uh, validation by the European Law Institute, and that will be towards the end of the calendar year. So thank you very much for your contributions and for joining this webinar. Thank you.